Good afternoon. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for, uh, for joining us uh, for this panel, The Long Shadow of War Veterans' Experiences on the Home Front. Um, our uh, uh, host and moderator, Zachary Bell, is going to be joining us momentarily, uh, and we thought we would go ahead and get started in the meantime. Um, uh, and uh, I think we'll just we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves one by one as we go along. Um, my name is Ken McLeish. I'm an anthropologist, and I teach in the program uh, in Medicine, Health, and Society at Vanderbilt University. And uh, my research and the subject of my book, Making War at Fort Hood, uh, Life and Uncertainty in a Military Community, is uh, uh, the question of how people experience war and military institutions in their daily lives. Um, I'm interested in the ways that people experience war as something that is normal and routine and highly organized, even as it's also incredibly intense, overwhelming, uh, and, and traumatic. Um, and uh, my, my research and writing are mostly based on time that I spent at uh, Fort Hood, uh, a, uh, uh, an army base in central Texas that I imagine a lot of folks have heard of. It's one of the largest and uh, busiest military installations in the world and one of the uh, most uh, centrally important U.S. military uh, installations to the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and it's a place where, uh, for that reason, war is really close to uh, uh, everyday life. Um, the, uh, uh, through a combination of things like lengthy and repeated deployments that, um, that can last uh, for 12 months, for 15 months, sometimes even longer than that, uh, often with uh, a year or far less time in between, um, all sorts of conditions that people return home uh, uh, from war with that, um, that affect their lives, affect their relationships, um, where these uh, uh, these, these basic sort of structural features of how war is waged and organized have, turn out to have very intimate and personal presences in, um, in people's uh, everyday lives. And that was the, the subject of my, my work and, and my investigation and what the book um, uh, uh, endeavors to illustrate. Um, I'm really excited to be sharing this panel with um, such insightful and important fellow chroniclers of American military experience, and uh, it's a it's a thrill to um, to be here with you both. And um, and it's a this is a, it's a realm of experience um, uh, uh, experience for people in the in the armed services, the people who share uh, who share their lives and their uh, their communities and their experiences but also for all of us for whom war and the military all of us as as civilians for whom war and the military is a major and significant and abiding preoccupation um, uh, this this realm of, of experience of uh, of military life and of war more generally is something that is on the one hand really kind of overburdened with cliches and assumptions and narratives that sort of tell us what we think we already know uh, uh, about war. Um, and on the other hand, somewhat paradoxically, it's also something that people tend to insist uh, can never be understood except by people who are there to experience it. And it's this, this weird kind of tension <coughs> between uh, between, on the one hand, sort of assuming that there's so much that we can take for granted about what war is and what it consists of, and on the other hand, this, um, this insistence of not being able to understand, which sometimes can sort of turn into a refusal to try to understand. Um, th these, two, uh, these two things are, are major reasons why I feel like it's important to try to tell stories about war and about military life that um, that both unsettle our assumptions and that also try to speak across this perceived divide in experience and understanding. Um, and so to that end, I mean, one of the, one of the things that uh, really struck me in my work and, um, uh, and that I tried to talk about in, uh, in my book uh, were the ways that war is not necessarily always limited to the people and places and times and kinds of actions that, uh, that we often associate most directly with it. It's not always terribly eventful. It's not always necessarily that conclusive, um, uh, in, again, in, in ways that we expect it to be, especially these wars uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which are notable both for their, their uh, extremely prolonged character and their, um, uh, their unconventional and, and asymmetric nature. Um, and, 
and so, uh, like I said, this is this is what sort of something that emerged from my concern and interest in uh, the ways that that war uh, sort of finds its way into uh, really intimate and personal aspects of people's lives, as well. And that's the that's the subject of the the short excerpt that I'd now like to share with you all. And um, uh, and uh, I'll just I'll just add one additional thing, which is just uh, an expression of thanks and gratitude for the folks who I spent time with and who uh, who sort of made their made their lives and stories available to me and and um, uh, and made it possible to do this work and write this book. Um, so the title of this section is uh, Tears at the Manifest. The departure and return events that bookend soldiers' deployments are called manifests. They're a bureaucratic roll call combined with either a prolonged and devastating farewell or a quick and joyful reunion. They have a sort of folk mythic significance in military communities as scenes of eventfulness and intensity that define the collective experience of absence, anxiety, separation, and strained attachment. The stone-faced inhumanity of the war apparatus and the extravagantly painful human frailty of the people caught up in it. People wanted to know if I had gone to a manifest and they wanted to make sure that I did go. A lot of the time manifests are held in gyms, of which there are several on post at Fort Hood. Indeed, the gym is such a familiar scene of imminent absence and endangerment that its bleachers and brick walls often provide the setting for ads for military life insurance that appear in Army Times. It seems both odd and appropriate that this wrenching ritual of departure should be set in a place laden with youthful associations of sex, competition, discipline, play, humiliation, and burgeoning bodily prowess. The gyms look like normal good-sized high school or YMCA gyms with patriotic slogans and icons, soaring eagles, geometric designs of stars and stripes on their cinder block walls above the stacked bleachers. But they do so much duty for manifests that there are signs hanging up permanently, banners with big block letter messages specific to the occasion but serving as constant reminders, <laughs> it would seem, to soldiers playing basketball or lifting weights. Above the doors out to the parking lot, come home safe. On the opposite wall, the first thing you see when you enter, welcome home. These rooms are configured for coming from and going to war. For whatever reason, this manifest is outdoors on the lawn uh, and the parking lot next to the Unit HQ building on Battalion Avenue. There is a long line of Battalion Headquarters buildings stretching for a mile or maybe more through this part of the post. And like all the others, this one is square, bland, and tan, inside and out. Not much of it, uh, excuse me, not much to it, but a long linoleum corridor, a reception desk, a handful of offices, a conference room. The walls are mostly bare. In front, a parched but well-kept lawn slopes to the street, and behind, a long uh, stretch of parking lot filling now with cars, and then a barracks, and next door, a narrow, equally nondescript warehouse, where in a couple of hours, soldiers will line up to receive their weapons. The manifest is for several, several hundred soldiers, a good part of a field artillery battalion. Some others are uh, deploying the next day, and a smaller number have already gone ahead. Field artil artillery is, or was at the time of this writing, uh, the only combat, combat arms branch with positions open to women, but still, the soldiers are mostly men. An acquaintance, Danielle, invited me. Her husband, Jean, is a senior NCO who has already served two OIF tours, so he got assigned to the unit's rear detachment, the part that stays in garrison while the rest is deployed. Danielle, tall, broad-shouldered, and with a disposition at once cheery and forceful, had spotted me in the parking lot of a, the volunteer organization where we both spent time.